All right, guys, welcome back. Yes. EYL, we're back home for a day. <laughs> Been a short moving, time, not a long time. Moving around the world. So this is a very important episode for a variety of different reasons. Um, if you follow EYL, you know that Mark and Mondays is on his world tour. Yeah. Started in LA, Toronto, Canada, London, Chicago, and we're going to end the year in Ghana. Very important so, to us. Ghana. Yeah, very intentionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Ghana is one of these places that has gotten a lot of recognition in the last couple of years yeah. for a variety of different things. But one of the main reasons why they've gotten recognition is um, a festival. My graduates from my school being Forbes. Bag drop. Bag drop. <laughs> a mic drop. Bag drop. Bag drop. Uh, it used to be called Afro Cella. Mm -hmm. It's changed its name to Afro Future. Yes. And um, it's real big. It's a culture, music type vibe. It yeah. has, um, I guess, brought in over $4 billion of tourism res yeah. revenue. That was in 2019. 2019. It definitely yeah. brought more in since then. Yeah. Okay. Created over 5,000 jobs. Yeah. We hire on average about 1,000 to 2,000 people every year. And it's at the end of December, so it's a big festival. It's music music festival, right? Yeah, but it's a cultural festival. Um, and, and for us, it's like equal parts music, equal parts fashion, equal parts art, equal part food. And all those elements come together to kind of create the experience that we're trying to create. Um, it's, a, it's an immersion of culture all at once. And it kind of takes all your senses at once. And I think that's why people keep coming back because it's a place where there's a safety, there is a beauty, and you see yourself and all the people around you, and you're really just having a good time. And I, and I think that's the beauty of what we've created. So, Abdul Kareem Abdullah. Yes, sir. Um, founder of Afrochella, currently called Afro Future. That's correct. Um, but you are a native of the Bronx. BX. BX. Forever. BX. Yeah, yeah. Forever. So your family, your family, your family's from Ghana. Burnside, to be specific. Yeah. <laughs> the side Avenue. Your, your family's from Ghana. You're from the Bronx. But first and foremost, thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Appreciate, appreciate you. Really appreciate yeah. it. You familiar with these parts? I am familiar with, with, with White Plains. You know, I actually got my prom my prom suit when I was high <laughs> the block at the gallery. Uh, exactly. Yo, rest in peace to the gallery. It closed last <laughs> closed. two weeks ago. Oh, really? I yeah, didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, wow, yeah. Rest crazy. in peace, man. It's a casualty of malls. You that's know, malls yeah. all around the country closing. They had some fly stuff there, I remember. <laughs> I, I was gonna get the right suit to match the Maury's. Yeah, we, we was talking. We was talking to <laughs> Jadakiss. Really we was talking to Jadakiss about this, and he was saying that you know he always had a chip on his shoulder coming from Westchester because everybody was like, was upstate. Like no, nobody really gave Westchester any credit. Um, <laughs> but the, I feel like the Bronx at least knows where Westchester is. Absolutely, Brooklyn. Yeah, they yeah. think Westchester is like. Man, Canada, it's, like it's, it's, next, yeah. it's next to Albany. Yeah. Nah, nah, nah. It was right there. I, I grew up in I grew up in the Bronx, so yeah. coming to Yonkers, my family lived right there. Yonkers by Riverdale, so I know Yonkers Ave. I know the block. Uh, my brothers actually still live on Yonkers, so I'm very familiar with Westchester for uh, sure. Bet. Yeah, appreciate, that. <laughs> appreciate that. Appreciate that. Appreciate <laughs> that. Absolutely. All right, so let's get into this. So, all right, you have a huge festival that you started. Yeah. Um, and then, like I said, the wave for Ghana has just been crazy because the year return. We'll talk about that and i think they have really done the best job at promoting tourism for black americans yeah because people want to go back to africa but there's never really been a, a roadmap of what to do where to go and so it's just like you just got a whole continent and it, of course egypt has always you know stood out for a historical standpoint mm -hmm. but for like a black experience there was never any roadmap and ghana kind of saw opportunity i think and really and then you come in and that plays a part. So where's the idea for the festival start? Um, it starts sometime in about 2015. Um, my partner, Kenny, Kenny of Japan, he's he's in Ghana right now. He lives in Ghana. Uh, and, you know, we, we he was fresh coming back from, you know, moving from the United States. He was in grad school and, uh, you know, he, he was finishing up grad school and he had a couple of Chinese guys that was graduating with him. And they were all talking about what they were doing after. And, you know, the Chinese guy was like, well, we're moving to Ghana. And he was confused. <laughs> and he was like, how y'all moving to Ghana? I'm from Ghana. I'm not even moving back to Ghana. So he ended up going to Ghana. And uh, that year, we were all in Ghana in December. And you What know, year was this? This is 2015. And, uh, you know, Europeans have always been in Ghana. So if they're from London, 
Germany, France, they've always been. It's only a six hour flight. It's not that uh, long of an experience. But we were there and we were like, very few Americans were there. So we always knew that there was an opportunity for us to bring uh, people back from uh, America. We were already doing parties here in the United States, just kind of like celebrating African culture. So bringing artists, having a perform, giving an experience to people like me who are like first generation that are growing up in the United States to kind of connect to the music. And we was like, you know, it just didn't make sense that there weren't enough Americans here seeing what the beauty was here. And I also kind of grew up between cultures, right? So at home, too, Afri too American to be African. And outside, of, you know, in school, I was an African kid, like in, in high school, throughout junior high school. So it was really just kind of like, how do I make people see, like, it's really lit out here, you know? Uh, and my team and I, we just started recording these videos, like, you know, the Africa they don't show you. Mm. And really just kind of like recording our experiences. And people were like, yo, that's that's Africa? That's that's really Ghana? That's And, you know, eventually we started bringing, you know, 10 people, 15 people, 40 people. And eventually, you know, we wanted to throw a party. Because, you know, we're like, you know, we throw parties in the city. We could do it in Ghana. And it, and it failed. So you, you was a promoter? I was a promoter. In the city? In the city. Yeah. Uh, like clubs? Africa. Clubs, yeah. Yes. I did uh, Stage 48, you know, a, a bunch of the big clubs sold it out. We, we've done a bunch of those. Gramercy Theater, I've done a bunch of concerts here as well before, you know, we went to, to, to Ghana to do that. You know, we threw the party, it failed. And I'm like, well, the beauty in the failure was that there were young artists that were performing that I thought were just kind of like excellent. And I just didn't understand why they weren't mainstream because they were that good. They were captivating. So I'm like, well, there's something here. Uh, so we had to reassess and in our meeting. I'm like, you know, I think the problem that we're having is everybody's throwing a party. Everybody is just like really coming here to party and most people will leave and they would say, oh, they were in Ghana, they were in Ghana, but they never connected. Or, you know, people on the ground would say, well, you diasporans are coming for two weeks, spend all your money and then leave mm -hmm. and nothing impact is coming. So diasporans. Yeah, so so basically that's, that's what that's the that's Twitter us. word for us. That's us. Like so that's all the black people that live outside, outside of yeah, the yeah. diaspora. Yeah, the yeah, diaspora. Yeah. So it was like, you know, you come in, you spend your little bread and you bounce and nothing is really impacting. And I'm like, Well, we can create an experience where now we can like connect people who are doing amazing things. Because if you look around the world, people in the diaspora are doing amazing things. You know, from Ghana, from Nigeria, yeah. from all parts of Africa. And I just felt like it was a love loss for us to just kinda like come to Ghana party and then leave and not really bring back some of the greatness that we were learning abroad. So so prior to 2015, I mean, you said you had, you're from, uh, your parents are from Ghana. Yeah. Had you been going back to the continent? Have you visited or you just like 2015, this is brand new to me, let's figure this thing out. No, so in 90, 1995, my dad sent us back to Ghana. Oh. They called us deportees. Uh, my aunts was calling us deportees because like, you know, it was like a punishment. Like, you know, um, for your parents to send you back to Africa. Every African kid that grew up in America or anywhere else knew when your parents told you that you was going to get sent back to Africa, it was like a punishment. And so they sent us back in 95. I went to school there. Uh, how long? I, I went to school there for seven and a half, eight years. Oh, eight years? Yeah, I thought yeah, it was, was like doing a summer trip. No, 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 no. I lived I lived in Ghana. Oh, wow. <laughs> I actually lived wow. in Medina. You know, I lived in North Carnation. So a lot of the relationships I have now in Ghana are built based on the fact that I lived there. And some of the students, some of the people that are my partners were my friends in school. Okay. That we grew up together. Some of the people that I look up to as big brothers in the industry, in the space in Ghana, are people that I've always looked up to and known since I was a kid. So I've had deep connections there. Um, I've seen what it's like to live there um, in luxury, but also not in not so much luxury. Um, and I've also lived here. So I've had best of both experiences and I, and I felt like I could communicate. I can go to Ghana and chill in Medina Zongo, which is where my grandmother's from. And I could be completely, completely fine or go to Nima you know, and be completely fine. Or go to the Jubilee House where the president is and, and, I'll, and be completely com uh, comfortable or front back anywhere in Accra, right? And I love the fact that I could do that in the Bronx. I could go to LA. I mean, I could be good in LA. I could go to, you know, anywhere in the, you know, I used to be afraid to go to Brooklyn, but now I'm in Brooklyn all the time. So it's like, you know, being able to kind of understand the cultures separately, but together it was something that um, has been an asset to us in building so what we built. I want to ask about the festival before then. Let's go through this. You're born in America. What year were you born? Eighty eight. You're born in eighty eight. And ninety five, mm -hmm. you go to Africa, Ghana for seven years. Yep. So that's like what, like third grade, something like that. Uh, yeah, second, second grade, second grade, grade, up until like I came back when I was in eighth grade. 
So you go from second grade to eighth grade, which effectively is like where you're actually growing up. So, so you're growing up in, in, in Ghana. You come back in for high school in New York? Yep. Went to Walton High School, high school for teaching professions in Walton. It was a high school was inside a, of the high school. Inside of the high school, inside of the high school. <laughs> so, you know, we wore uniform. It was crazy. Um, but, you know, even like transitioning between coming back from Ghana to go to school, it was a culture shock because I, I hear students talking back to teachers. Well, that's what I, so that's what I was getting at. <laughs> so it's like, all right, you, like French Montana, he, he moved to the Bronx. Yeah. From Morocco, 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 Africa, but he just was in there for twelve years and then moved. So it's it's not as I, you were in America in the Bronx, yeah. went to Ghana and came back to the Bronx. Yep. How was that for you as far as a culture shock is concerned? And we have another friend from Nigeria, and he was saying like in Nigeria, like that's real popular. Like parents make sure that their kids go back to to um their country for a couple of years. Just they don't want them to lose the culture. Yeah. And they don't even live with them. Like they'll send them with an aunt or an uncle. I lived with my grandmother and my uncle. So I lived with my uncle the first couple of years and then with my grandmother, um, which was an experience. My uncle hustled in Japan, as in he left Ghana to go to Japan to learn how to like make money. So he moved back to Ghana to start his own businesses. And, uh, but he, it was very different in the day because I'm not with my parents. I don't really know him as an uncle like that. Mm-hmm. I just met him. When I moved into his house, you know, we're living in a house that is in Medina Zongo. It's very different than the people we go to school with, who are all living in like luxury. So my dad kind of, in his mind, he did that purposefully because he wanted us to be able to have that balance. Uh, at the time, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't like it. I just, it was just kind of like I didn't understand why they would leave us here. You mm-hmm. know, every once in a while, like they'll make us feel happy by like shipping us a bunch of boxes of cereal mm. or like <laughs> powder milk. You know, it's real man. You know, you know, it just kind of made you take um, appreciation for like being able to go to the corner store and get like a gallon of milk um, or get a bag of chips or a quarter soda after the quarter water or something like that back then so whenever we would get to come back for the summertime were the best times right because then you get to go back to Ghana and go to school and show them all the new kicks show them all the new gear tell them like all the new music that's you're coming out yeah you the man all right when you, you, you when you have that uh I guess proximity to abroad in Ghana during those times you were the man like you know what I mean it was it was very very popular I think the internet has kind of changed that because now they can see everything mm-hmm. as we see it um, but back then, you know, you were the man because you kind of brought them culture that they didn't really uh, have access to. So, yeah, it was interesting. So and in, I think we came right around 9-11. We moved back to the U.S. And uh, my pops was like, you know, do you guys want to stay? And we're like, yes, dad, we want to stay. <laughs> please. <laughs> please. Yes, and like, you know, and, um, you know, we stayed. And, and it was it was a culture shock because going to school, like, I knew about the clothes. Like, you know, my brother would let me hold his Jordans. I'll never forget. You know, that's the reason why till to this day I, I'm still trying to find – the cool gray 11s because you know my dad my brother would let me rock the cool gray I should have put those up yeah i know but it's cool the threes are my favorite all right we got those right? too. <laughs> um so you know our rockers you know and you know the thing that connected all of us was hip-hop like you know at the time i think jada kiss and beanie siegel was was, was going at it, was going at battle, it. and yeah. uh, my brother was like always putting us on to like the music the mixtape, you know, letting us know what's going on yeah. so you know that was the one thing i could connect with them on because you know, we we were taught to be demure, like to teachers. Like you couldn't talk back to a teacher. You couldn't look at him in the eye because you were afraid that you would get beat. And I was in Ghana; they would beat you in school. Yeah. So back here, people were just cursing at teachers. Yeah. I, just, I like, was I was on. I've seen. I was on the yeah, other end of that. I used, to, I used to look at like you, know, you talking it? to the teacher like that? like you know what I mean. So it was um it was an interesting you know culture shock. culture shock at the time because I wasn't used to that for a very long time. I I couldn't understand how people were talking to teachers like that at the time. How quickly you know, did you adapt to that? Uh, you know, I never talked back to it. I think I, one time in high school, but that's that was out of anger, man. Somebody was trying to play me. You know, you know, in high school they was throwing paper and that's stuff different. like that. Yeah, back yeah, then. yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are those are things. That's like the only fight I've ever had in high school, and you know that. But outside of that, like you know, it was it was dangerous then because did there you, was a lot of gangs and did you did you schools. did you have issues like embracing your African because like you said now it's, it's a vibe as far as um, Afro beats has really you know it made it cool but back then you know kids is ignorant and, and cruel and just people which is ignorant in general so I see I've personally seen like African kids getting teased yeah like you know what I'm saying and it's is it, it looking back on it? That's something that's very mis. Un, it's unfortunate, but I've seen it happen and in any group of people right that's just happens like so 
I guess sometimes you either like drill down on just like becoming, you just have a pack of people or sometimes you just try to assimilate and you try to get away from who you are. Nah, um, I couldn't do that. My parents had a restaurant. It was really well known that this is a restaurant. When I came back from Ghana, I had an accent. It was thick, like, you know what I mean? Um, but you know, it was just jokes, right? So if somebody joked on me, I joked on them. Like, I'm African, but I'm flyer than you. Like, those kind of things worked <laughs> yeah, back then. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but, yeah. but you know what I'm saying? It would, it would just be like quick jokes. And then eventually, you know, kids are shallow in, the, in that. They didn't really joke on you if you was fly, like, or if you had like a little bit of money or something like that. Like, yeah. it, it was like yeah. the one Bless thing you. that, that yeah. um, let them know. And then also like, I had a, I have a very big family in the Bronx. Like, you know what I mean? I have seven brothers eight brothers mad cousins like you know what i mean so it wasn't something that people he wasn't really, an outcast i wasn't yeah. an outcast i wasn't something that like i don't remember ever getting picked on like you know um because you know my big brother would come on mm -hmm. and maybe once in eighth grade you know i got picked on. my <laughs> brother came up to the so some things you don't forget yeah so some, you don't forget that like you know what i'm saying but like i always had people in my community that was like always gonna hold it down and I knew the blocks, like right you know, on Burnside Avenue, that's our neighborhood. Like people knew like my whole family. Nobody really messed with my pops. Wow, Dominicans up there. All of them know like who my pops is and who my block like my brothers are and my yeah. family is. They don't really Cedric Avenue, you know, on right there. Birth of hip hop. You know, right by Walton Avenue. You know, we grew up there. So my, my cousins were, were there and they were in the neighborhood for a long time. Nobody really messed with us. Like, you know, so it was really just about being able to get from high school to home, right? So being able to <laughs> yeah, bypass that four train. People really don't understand that part yeah. of being like, and it, it's something I had to learn, right? So yeah. we went to school out here, but like when I started teaching there and I started coaching, I'm so used to being transported to and from like like a game by a school bus yeah. until I realized I gotta take the five train. Yep. And I gotta take two train and I gotta take the bus. And it's like, you're susceptible to everything, but then you everything. forget like the kid who's getting on the bus at 10 years old or the trainer, he's susceptible to everything too. So yeah. like that, being in New York City, like those things, you don't even think, you it just kind of like, all right, it's part of life. I didn't realize it was trauma until I got to Syracuse. Okay. Um, because University? I was, yeah, Syracuse, right? Like, you would go through the metal detectors to go to school. Yep. Um, you know, there was a time where I, I didn't even go to the second floor because DDP was there. Like, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was just like if you were black, you was, you know, anything could happen. Uh, or the nine bus or the 22 bus, you know, people coming from Kennedy. <laughs> right from Kennedy, yeah. then you meeting with people going t from Walton on the four train, coming with people from Evander. It was just like so many different ways that it was dangerous. That you know, it was an interesting time. But you know, thankfully, like you know, for me, I was always a pretty good student. But also, like because I had my family, you know, I didn't really have that many problems. I, I knew people in Roosevelt, I knew people in all of these schools that like will always hold it down for, for me and the family. So we never had much worries, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And you know, my dad told us how to defend ourselves as well in the block as well. Yeah. So we was always good. Um, but it was definitely a culture shock because it was something I didn't have to worry about in Ghana. Like, you know, in Ghana, all I had to worry about was going to school, the driver will come pick us up, take us home, the food will be made for us. You know, maybe they iron our clothes for us, they wash our clothes for us on the weekend. I didn't have to worry about any of that. When I came to the, back to America, it was just kind of like a reality about, you know, knowing how to protect yourself in that time. And I think New York is completely different than it was when I was growing up in high school. From, you know, from my perspective now, maybe I'm just kind of- In what way? I just don't think it's as dangerous. You know, I remember the Bronx like, it was definitely. A, the Bronx yeah, I, 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 I just remember like more, it's more dangerous yeah, now. Oh, it ain't changing. No, but I just remember <laughs> like I remember like it was a thing to not wear red. Oh yeah, the gang thing. Yeah. The gang thing that was early stages of the gang. Yeah, yeah. So that was so, like heavy. They were still like tripping off of colors. Yeah, like, it's not like that now. But it's I still that. it's still heavy. You no, know, I remember like yeah. being afraid to get a buck fifty. Like you know that was that's like a, a thing. Yeah, that was that's that was a, a real fear, yeah. right? So. Yeah. And I feel like I don't necessarily know that that is a thing that I, I, I'm like afraid to do. Like, I, I don't know a block in New York City that I'm afraid to walk on. Back then, it was like, yo, I don't know about going there. Like, but you was also a, a kid though, too. Yeah. I was and also a kid. That's yeah. what I'm saying, your, your environment, that's all you know, right? Yeah, it, it's yeah, like absolutely. that eight block radius. It's yeah, like, all right, yeah. we don't leave here. Nah, nah, and if nah. we do, we better be on guard <laughs> if we leave here. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, it was interesting. I think that all of that just kind of made me who I am and 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 all of that has seeped through in, in, in the way I've developed the business and how I'm thoughtful about how we invite people, how we extend our relationships to like the different people that we collaborate with and, mm -hmm. and, and have them come back to Ghana because it's really just to kind of show them that like there's a completely new world where you can just kind of like walk freely. You, to me, one of my joys is like walking in Ghana and seeing my friends that are not from Ghana just 
walk just in be. the streets, just be. And I love that for them. You you said that, I mean, obviously you, you've created a successful business, but it's not the business that your dad had. No. Right? So the restaurant business, was was there any like pressure that this was gonna be passed down to you when you didn't go in that direction? Like what what was some of the lessons that you learned watching your dad in the business and you know that succession plan? Yeah, I always wanted to go to medical school. Um, so when I graduated from Q's, it was like, all right, I want to get a master's and probably get some research support. And then, I, I, you know, I'm going to go to medical school. And then my pops was like, well, I'm not paying. And I'm like, you're not paying? Like, I'm always <laughs> going to school. Like, what do you mean? He was like, yeah, but you could, you know, come work in a restaurant, take it over. You know, I'm a, I make more than doctors. Like, that was his thing, right? Like, I make more than doctors. How much you make as a doctor? I tell him, like, well, I make more than that. Like, you know, it was his thing about saying, like, he makes more than, like, we should just own our own business. It didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that's where we clashed because I just didn't understand at that time, all I wanted to do was be a doctor. So he kicked me out. <laughs> he kicked me out of his crib. He's like, you know, yeah. I think I was 22. He's like, you know, how old are you? I think you're 22. He's like, all right, you're a grown man now. You know, you got three months. I'm like, three months? I'm like, all right, cool. No problem. It took me like four or five, but that's when I ended up moving to Queens. You know, I, you, I think you used to be Emilio's uh, financial advisor, Emilio. Me, Emilio. Oh, um, yeah. from the um, fraternity. Yeah, 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 that's my frat brother. I thought you so meant Emilio like, Sparks. Yeah, nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, so Emilio was, he was actually yeah, my yeah, roommate. Yeah. He was actually my roommate when I moved out. Actually, back then. So, um, yeah, there, there's pressure always um, to kind of take over the business. I mean, I, I cook as well. Him and I, that's where we bond because. You know, in my family, like the men always cooked for Thanksgiving. As far back as I know, we make Sunday breakfast, you know, for my family. So it was like he wanted me to do that. And, you know, I just needed to kind of like find my way to it or find my way around doing what I wanted to do at the time. And I think just kind of even moving out was like the best decision for our relationship in general. So let's fast forward this situation back to the, the festival. So the first thing you do is not successful. Correct. You throw a party in Ghana and it doesn't work out. Yeah. What makes you want to restructure and go forward? And when do you actually become successful with the festival? There was no purpose behind the party at the time when we threw it. It was just really just to kind of like throw a turn up. Just because. Just because. And I think that I realized that very quickly. Right. Um, you know, in, in you know, one thing I like, because I, I did clinical research for a long time. So failure doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't like grow or learn lessons from it. Um, you know, even in research, when the research fails, they write a paper about it. And I think that for me, it was just kind of like understanding, like, look, we didn't have a full understanding of what we was trying to do. There was no purpose behind it. And in that, I also saw a purpose because I saw that there were young artists that were doing amazing work that also performed, even though there weren't that many people there, they were willing to perform and they killed it with so much energy. I thought that there, there needed to be something for them. Around the same time, you know, it's coincidental. I think the way things work for me, when I came back, uh, my dad was looking to open up his restaurant in Harlem. Um, so we have a second location in Harlem. And uh, he's like, you know, you, you, I've always had the taxi drivers because he opened in the early 80s, you know. So taxi drivers at the time, a lot of them didn't have their wives in America. So they would come and they would buy bulk and they would have some for their fridge. It's like, I've always had that community. But we want to get some of the young crowd that are now looking to eat African food, looking to try to off and things of that nature. So what can you do? You throw parties, like, can you bring some of that energy here? So I wanted to do a full festival. And that's how the proposal started to come into my head for what will become Afro Chill and later on Afro Future. And I, you know, I kind of married all of those. It took me about two and a half years, three years to kind of just kind of perfect it into what will become the festival. And by the time I started doing the research, um, I just couldn't afford it in America. I was like, yo, this I'm not going into debt. I already owe Q's money. I'm not doing that. Um, so, you know, I talked to my partner about it. He was like, you know, let's try it in Ghana. Everybody's coming. And this could be an opportunity for us to bring people back, you know. Um, and then, you know, I told him, like, I have always had a venue in my mind in Ghana that I wanted to use. And it's called the Accra um, Polo Club. It's a very distinguished venue, like real rich Accra, uh, old money. They, they tend to congregate there. Mm -hmm. But it's a very beautiful. When you land in Ghana, it's one of the first things you see um, as you're coming in. And it's so beautiful. So I was like, you know, I want it there. And literally, he was like, you want it there? Cool. He called me back in two hours. It's booked. And that was like April 2017. And then we had like about seven or eight months to plan what would become the first one. 
and uh, it was pretty successful. At the time, we didn't, we've never thrown a festival, so we were just trying to throw a party. We, you know, we could get our minds around a day party festival. Mm -hmm. We knew that we wanted the elements of an activation. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember 2017, there was that issue in Libya where they, they had enslaved people. Um, so after the Gaddafi after he died, after he died, they mm -hmm. had like a slavery with black people in, mm -hmm. in Libya. So we had uh, uh, this um, renowned artist his name is Okunta in Ghana. He, he did an installation, so that was our first ever installation uh, from that festival. And then we have vendors. We knew that if we could stimulate the the local businesses or individuals who wanted to start business in Ghana to vend and create opportunities, that that would also help us bring out the people. Yeah. So we had thirty vendors that year. Uh, Jameson was the only partner that was willing to take us on. We were brand new. Nobody like really believed in what we were trying to do. So we really had to put our own money up. So we put our own money up, and we were shooting for 2,500 people. But we ended up doing 4,600 people. How, how, how cash intensive is this? Right, and You said it was April. You, you came up with it. Obviously, you got seven months. What's happening in between seven months? You, you're, like, is it you and your partner finding the sponsors, going back and forth to Ghana or Accra specifically? Like, What's happening? Yeah, so at the time, I wasn't going back and forth to Ghana. So I, the one thing I did know from research was like my project management skills. So how to like say, all right, this is the date that we started. This is the date that we're ending. Now let's figure out everything in the middle to kind of project manage it. Um, at that time, I was the one going out looking for sponsorship. I didn't understand the language of sponsors. So all I knew was, do I have this event? Can you put your logo? I'll put your logo here. I'll put your logo here. But I didn't realize that, you know, it was about mutually beneficial relationships, how to kind of bring out the value in their priorities versus the values in our priorities. So I didn't understand that. Yeah, so we was like feeling. We didn't understand why we were feeling because we were selling tickets. But the one thing that we had that was on our side was that we were really good at, we had some marketing ideas that we knew would shock, the, shock Ghana. Like we put up a billboard uh, for, for the event. And people were like, who are these guys? Like, why y'all think y'all could put up a billboard? Like, you know, and then at the name the name was Afrochella, so they you know, they roasted us all over the gram, all over Twitter. So that what they say. Like you know, so like who you guys think you are, Afrochella, is this Coachella? You know, they said a whole bunch of stuff like that at the time. Um, and you know, we just like, you know, we know what we're doing. When we put the name together, Afrochella, really we was trying to like communicate echoes of African sound because, you know, the cello just is a real, um, for us, it's a Latin word for sounds. So we were trying to say African sounds, but it didn't really connect with people like that. They thought something else. So they were roasting us on a, on, on Twitter. For Black, Black Twitter? Twitter. Yeah. Black Twitter. Uh, Ghana Twitter. Ghana, so Twitter. Ghana Twitter. Was like, in America, Ghana, we're Ghana Twitter, with Ghana cello, Twitter was Ghana Twitter was, was, was unrelenting to us. You know, but honestly, it made us better because it kept us on our toes, right? And... When we put up the billboard, all of that, the momentum came. Uh, people would tell us they're not going, they're not going. And then we sold, I think, 3,000 tickets. And I'm like, yo, I don't think we got the space. We need to stop selling tickets. Were you selling tickets in Ghana or people from America? We were selling tickets all over. So we were surprised that year we still had about 30% of people coming in from America. So 30% was from America. Yeah. That, that 70, first year. 70% from Africa. From Africa, from Africa, from Africa Did you, right? Is there talent involved or is it just like... At the time, we had some talent that are now some of the biggest out of Ghana. Yeah. So we had King Promise, we had Quincy Arthur, um, Chris you won a BET award. Um, King Promise has done a bunch of songs with Wizkid. He's doing his thing. And we had this one young lady who was a very promising at the time. Her name was Ebony. We we were her last show. She actually passed a year after. Oh, wow. But she was a dancehall reggae artist and she was like really at the top of her game. She was our biggest asset. But we all we used all rising stars, right? So we knew that these people were gonna be the next up, but we could afford them because we didn't really have the budget at the time to kind of get some of the big acts. And I think in hindsight, that might have been our biggest um, our biggest win because it kind of took away the focus from just the talent that were on the stage to kind of the experience. Mm -hmm. And people loved it. And, you know, people traveled for just that one day in 2017. We have a video on our phone that says, you know, I traveled here for one day all the way from Denmark for one day just to come to this. And I thought that was very, very beautiful to see that people believed and what we were doing. So we ended up stopped ticket sales because we were afraid that we were gonna oversell and we weren't gonna be able to deliver. Um, but my partners and I went back and forth, but we ended up capping at 4,600 people on the first year. And we had so many ideas that we didn't get to execute. How much were the ticket prices? 
I think the ticket prices then was like forty dollars, forty dollars. I think forty dollars was for VIP, and I think twenty five dollars or something like that. I don't, I don't, I don't really remember. That's a long time ago. Actually, I should know that. I'm, I'm gonna go. For, I got, I gotta go research that. But I think it was like forty dollars maximum. We wasn't trying to charge too much. Um, you know, we had Jameson supporting us, and and it was successful. It was, it was good. We were able to close it, no issues, and we knew we had something. Um, and we knew we had ideas that we wanted to execute. So the next year we expanded. We, we went to a stadium, and then we got roasted again because we had a we had used a venue called Elwak Stadium that was a rundown park that people went to go train, play soccer on, or run around. But nobody really did events there. It was a stadium, but we had a vision that we could recreate this to make this look something completely different. We got roasted again, <laughs> um, but uh, it was a great year in 2018 because we went from 4,600 to 12,500 people. And we had bigger artists that year. We had Stoneboy, who is right now going around the circuit. He just signed a Def Jam, doing mm -hmm. amazing work. Um, he was a headliner that year. Uh, we also always have like an old school um, legacy act, pe people that our parents probably saw, but none of us saw it in, um, in uh, performing. So we wanted to kind of bring all of that element. That was also the first year that a lot of black Hollywood started to come to the events. So we had Jackie Aina, we had um, Boris Kujo and his wife, and some of the others. Uh, Ebro, I think, was there in 2018 as well um, for our first big one. So we went from 4,500, 4,600 to 12,500. I don't think we were even prepared for that scale as far as the team, as far as just like structure or even understanding how to like manage the festival. How, how was the marketing, right? Because you went, that, that takes a lot. You go from 4,000 to 12, almost 13,000, and now you're getting, I guess, you're getting black Americans, I guess, celebrities to come. What's the marketing, or is it just like people are getting like, word of mouth? Yeah, it was word of mouth, and it was like, you could feel the energy in the city, you knew you had to go there. We didn't have any paid dollars behind any marketing at that time. We didn't have any really marketing experience. We didn't even have a marketing person. Really, um, what our model was like a pay it forward method. Right? You know, if you went, more often than not, you brought like two more people with you. And that kind of helped us grow uh, very organically. And everyone that couldn't go the first year had that so much formal that they wanted to come the second year. Mm -hmm. And then 2018, obviously, it went viral. It hit Shade Room. And everybody saw all the celebs dancing with, you know, with Pope folks. And that year, some more Americans came in and their post went viral because people couldn't ex understand how like these people were just having such a great time. It was that year that Ghana announced the year of return mm. in 2018, and that would be 2019. Talk so, about talk about the year of return for people that don't know what that is. Yeah, so the year of return uh, marks uh, 400 years since the first ever slave ships moved from Jamestown, Accra, to Jamestown, Virginia. And Ghana... Um, it's called Jamestown? Jamestown. Accra? Jamestown, Accra. Is that is that for a reason? It's no, I mean, it's going from Jamestown to Jamestown. Is that just a coincidence, or is that? It's not a coincidence. I think it was named by the fort, the fort that was being um, like they purposely like this is Jamestown here, yeah. and it's going to Jamestown here. Correct. The same. Correct. The same fort. Travel pattern. The same. Travel so it's going to be called the same thing. Exactly. Maybe I, I, that might be the case, but I got to get back to it now. I don't know, but I would say that it, that was four hundred years since that first ever uh, migration. The first ladies ever left Ghana. It's like the 1619 around, Project. 1619 Project, right? Yep. So Ghana proclaimed that 400 years as the year of return. When you go to Ghana and you visit the slave castles, you'll see this door of no return. And it was the last door that slaves went through to be able to kind of see their lives in Ghana. That was the last time. When you went through that gate, you were just going into slavery. You were never coming back. So the idea was for us to kind of open the door for people to return. And what they did was uh, one of, I guess, one of the first ever um, slaves that moved from Ghana, individuals that became slaves, that were enslaved, that moved from Ghana, was returned through the door and was buried in, in the castle. And they marked it as the year of return. So Ghana started using it as an opportunity to invite descendants of enslaved people to come back to Ghana and, and, and be able to kind of seek residency, to be able to engage with the people, and to open up really dialogue between the diaspora and Ghana specifically. And honestly, that has opened the door for many other countries to also visit, uh, to invite people back as well. Uh, it was an amazing experience because you will walk down a block and you would see somebody that you had no idea would ever be in Ghana. An example of that is my partner Kenny was outside the festival and he ran into a third grade teacher. 
And she asked him, what's he doing here? He's like, well, this is my event. <laughs> and that, that to me, that was beautiful. Um, people that I never imagined in my life that I went to high school with that, that came to Ghana or that would be in Ghana shocked me because I just never, ever thought that they would be in, in Ghana or enjoy Ghana or even consider it. Um, so it was an amazing year because that year alone, Ghana gave over a million visas out and, and granted a whole, um, a million plus visas. And to put that in context, Ghana normally did about 150,000 a year. So to do a million visas in that year was a very big deal. And 16% of that was because of our festival as well. Yeah, so th there's a part there that kind of gets overlooked. It's like, you guys know you have something special, Yeah, but the government must know you have something special Absolutely. as well. Yeah. At what point do they say, we need to figure out who these guys are, we need to work with them, let's work together. Because I know at some point, you become like the ambassador of tourism. Yeah, so it became in 2019 was the first year we had a partnership, official partnership with Ghana Tourism Authority. Um, that granted us opportunities to open up a visa on arrivals. It gave us opportunities to kind of um, push through policies, uh, things of that nature, to kind of reduce the kind of issues that people were facing and get into Ghana, whether it was, um, you know, immigration issues, whether it was like, you know, you had to have vaccine cards, those kind of things we were able to kind of like clear so people could ha not have so many issues or barriers to coming into into the country as well. Um, those kind of things were some of the things we were able to do in the first year. They were also able to help us logistically around the, the, the country to kind of reduce the amount of issues that we were facing with maybe hotel bookings or like police um, escorts or military escorts where necessary. Even the venue, um, there's a military venue that we use as well. So just kind of navigating that and making sure we have all the permits for some of the things that they were able to help us. In 2021, we be, actually became Goodwill Ambassadors to Ghana. Um, and then we were challenged to bring, what, 20,000 people to Ghana for our festival. Um, and we were able to do that and accomplish that. So as of right now, I'm still a goodwill ambassador to Ghana. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So you, you go, and this is similar to, because we do a festival called Invest Fest. Yeah. So the first year we did it, we had like 4,000 people. And the second year we had 14,000 people. Crazy. And now we're looking at 20,000 for this year, the third year. So we... We know about scaling a festival, and we know about how challenging it is. So let's let's take this apart. Booking talent, that's not easy. No. Um, talk about that. Talk about booking the talent, and the writers, and paying them, you know, artists, and a variety of different things that come into that. All right. So some of the things that we have in place in Ghana that is a big asset to us is the infrastructure around us. So my partner, Kenny, manages an entire media studio, uh, we have TV, radio, um, all of that in Ghana, and we have that. Another partner of ours, uh, BBNZ Live, is a creative studio. They also have a TV station, radio station, newspaper print as well. So as far as the structure and a, and a, and a record label, so at the time, um, BBNZ was managing um, EL as well and they also did tours for Lauren Hill so actually in 2018 Lauren Hill did our first uh, opening party for the festival in 2018 so that was that was Miss Lauren Hill she 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 really showed love by was she on time she was on time she oh, was on time she's yes. like a, she's a, she's like a big friend of the family like in Ghana our, our, our partner Alvin does a lot of work with her um around bringing African artists to America and work with her so she did a tour diaspora calling first time a lot of the artists like Mr. Easy, Stone Boy, and some of these were on the stage. So she always showed love to us. Um, so these things that we have in place allowed us to be able to do a lot of things a lot easier. So we've had the same booker since 2017. Her name is Khadija. Um, she works for a record label now, but she has relationships with almost all the artists, at least in West Africa. Um, and that allows us to be able to kind of talk to talent and say, hey, look, this is what we need. Um, the structure of agencies are now coming to Africa where some artists are signing with agencies like CAA, WME, and things of that nature. But on the continent, when you're on the continent, it's like, I don't need to go and talk to WFM in <laughs> Europe. I could talk to the manager that lives up the block. Uh, so she has done an amazing job at making sure that we've been able to get any artist we want as long as our budget suffices. Um, and, and pretty much that's how we, we've been doing it. Now, you see, in Africa, 
getting the talent to agree to perf- um, to perform is one job. The next getting job is perform. getting them to perform. Well, I was is another late, job. Like, no disrespect to Lauren Hill, she's a legend. <laughs> yeah. But obviously, she's had issues with, with being late to shows. But people don't like that's a nightmare for a promoter or somebody doing like you think somebody's coming on at eight, they don't come on to 11, and then people's getting restless and they like, I want my money back. So you've had issues with artists being late though, right? I've had issues not necessarily late, uh, but more so, yeah, I guess you could call it late, um, but more so like difficult to deal with, as in maybe we can't get their biometric pages to book their flights in time, mm. or maybe last minute they want to, you know, they feel like they're a bigger artist now, they want more money, um, or maybe their rider is just like, you ridiculous. know, just ridiculous, <laughs> or maybe they signed a contract and they want to change. We've had situations where an artist signed um, a contract we paid. They, they asked for hundred percent of the money up front, which is something we never do. But for this particular artist, we knew he was going to be the next one. We were like, you know what? We'll pay you hundred percent of the other fee. And then you know, at the time, it was just five flights. And we're like, all right, cool. We could do five flights. It's not that bad. And then you know, closer to the show, he's like, yeah, you know, I know I said five flights, but you know, if you guys can give me the money, we, um, no, actually, can you guys get us a private jet? <laughs> and we're like, no, we're probably not going to get you a private jet. We agreed to five flights. It's like, well, can you guys give us the money? Then we'll cover the rest on a private jet. It's like, well, it's too late because we buy our flights in bulk. So there's no way we could get you this, um, get you a private jet. So in those situations, it gets dicey because you never know whether the artist is going to show yeah. or not, or they're going to get on the flight. Um, you know, I, I think that those are some of the difficulties that we have faced um, as far as talents are concerned. You know, in Africa also, in Ghana, Ghana just went through a very big inflation process, like where one dollar went up to about fifteen Ghana cities. Um, for reference, when we started the festival in twenty seventeen, one dollar was three Ghana cities, and even in twenty nineteen, one dollar was about maybe four Ghana cities at maximum. So in twenty twenty two, for one dollar to be at twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. You can imagine, like the the cost of everything just kind of went crazy um, across the board. So it, it was it was very difficult for us to kind of like navigate flights and all of that stuff as well. So when artists are charging what they're charging now, right? Last year we had Burner Boy, so you can already call, know what he cost. Yeah, Burner Boy last year. Yeah, Burner Boy last year. How much he charged? A lot of money. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of money. I'll a tell a you. million. <laughs> It's close. It's close. I mean, you know, it's close. Like it's very close to to, to that. The year before we had Whiskid, so you you know, like so. these rates are not like cheap. Not cheap. They're not cheap, and and it's like fifteen, twenty, thirty artists on 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 the bill. Do they show love? They sh- some of them. Some of them show love. So we have very good relationships with a lot of artists, but you know, a lot of artists because now you have like a live nation that's gonna give you thirty shows. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's you're not incentivized to kind of say, you know what, like, you know, let me... You know what, festivals festivals messed up. So we do, we, we book artists for a variety of different things, yeah. in my opinion, and I've been doing some market research on this. Festivals have messed up pricing for artists because now there's so many artists, there's so many festivals in America, I'm talking about, like... Yeah, there's no, so many, in Europe too. Yeah, there's so many festivals that all these artists are getting paid crazy amount of money, more money than they traditionally should get Mm-hmm. Or that they even deserve to be completely honest with you about Agreed. it. And now that's that's over inflating their cost. over inflating the market. Yeah. So it's like it's really about competition, right? So if I if you are really worth three hundred, but you know, this guy over here is costing you seven hundred, it's giving you seven hundred, you're gonna you're mm-hmm. gonna wanna take that seven hundred. It doesn't matter what relationship you have. With me, you're gonna come back and say, "Yo, I know you offering 300. That's my rate, but this guy's offering me 700. I got to take that." And a lot of that, we were dealing with a lot of that, right? Because as we open up the market, some of the things we learned in 2017, we created a SWOT analysis, like you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. We always knew that because we didn't have a crazy big investment, we never raised. This was my money and my partner's money and our team's money, right? We we knew that somebody with bigger pockets, once we open up the market, could come in and like really take over our market or try to at least. So for us, it was about the strategy was about having deep roots in the community, so mm-hmm. that even if they did come in, we could survive. And we've survived with that. But when there are multiple things happening at the same time, what end up happening is there's competition for cost, right? Because if um, and that's you know in Ghana also 
that just doesn't just talk about artists. It talks about equipment, right? So if you have a camera person that like owns um, X amount of cameras and there are multiple events, then they're going to be able to start a bidding war as, you know, this is because there's only very few, you know, people who can do the expertise, right? A flyer in Ghana can cost you anywhere between $75 and $100. For a flyer? For one flyer? For a flyer. But that hundred dollars is the equivalent of ten dollars. No, a hundred dollars US dollars. A US dollars. For a proper a flyer. Now out here you can get it for forty dollars, fifty dollars because there's so many people you can go to. But there are very few who can do it at the quality that we needed to in Ghana. So because of that it costs more. So do it real quick, because now I'm thinking about the cost and like obviously one of the things that can combat that cost or alleviate the cost is sponsorship. Yeah. And so before in 2017, you didn't have the, you said you didn't have the language. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm assuming that that's something that you had to learn when you guys went down yeah. and you thought about strength and weaknesses. So what is some of the language in getting sponsorship? Because it's not easy, yeah. right? Like, especially when you want to have a large scale event and you've seen scaling throughout the years, how do we now approach sponsors and use the proper language to say, this is going to help your brand as well. Yeah, I would say the first, uh, so look at sponsors were easier for us to get because obviously we had people there. So it was easy for them to kind of come in and activate. In 2019, we had, 2018, we had like a few other um, smaller brands that came on and gave us some money. 2019 is when we had the biggest sponsors, right? We had Twitter. Twitter was the first um, major sponsor that we had. We had a hashtag emoji. They came, built an activation. They sent individuals down to kind of create content with us. Uh, it was a year before they opened up their office in Ghana, and they marked us as one of the reasons as a partner. And it was their first ever activation on the continent. Um, by that time, we had understood what we had. We understood the data. We understood where they were coming from, their age range, their spending capacity. We understood um, their buying habits things that they, they liked. We had feet surveys from them about what was good, what was bad, what, what the opportunities were that we could- um, These are the attendees? The attendees. Oh, okay. So now I can go and sit to a sponsor and just not tell them I have an event. I can tell them, well, I have 30% are men from this age and 60% are women from this age. They like this, they like dogs, they like this. Uh, you know, so you know, if you have a company that's interested in this kind of market, how can we work together? You know, um, at the time we knew Twitter eventually was gonna open our office in Ghana. So we know, look, this is an opportunity for us to work together to kind of create an experience right here. Um, we also had Uber that year that was also launching in Ghana. So we have, we were able to kind of use their platform to kind of communicate to people, but also get people to just kind of reduce the amount of cars they were taking by taking Ubers and, and creating an opportunity there. So we, we, at the time we knew how to like utilize our space and optimize it to kind of bring more partners into the space. Mm -hmm. um, and we've grown ever since. Uh, last year was the first year we actually had a partnership team to kind of build the partnership program that just really kind of understands like how to parse out every single aspect of our festival ground from the barricades to the entrances to the exits to the staging to the different screens in the space to the bars to, to like every single piece of the space that we have that we can monetize we we, we look to to try and monetize and and that gave sponsors more opportunities and then we also realized that because it was Africa and a lot of them didn't have offices in Africa, it was very difficult for them to market. So the work that we were doing were being a trust broker. At the same time, we were being an influencer because we were bringing them to the market. And then at the same time, we were being an agency because we were the first one like kind of bringing them to the space. Mm. Um, so we had to create more events around the festival to give them multiple touch points so that they can like optimize their institution. Uh, one of the things that I learned is that yeah, you may be working with Twitter, but there's Twitter marketing. There's Twitter for, um, you know, for podcasts. This is just an example. Twitter for cartoons. Twitter. So understanding that the, although there's one company, there are multiple businesses within the company that have different budgets, and understanding how to like optimize all of those uh, parts of the company to come together to support you in order to be able to maximize the dollars that are coming in was some of the things that we had to learn and we didn't know upfront. Um, and you know, luckily. A bit of partnership is also like who you know as well, right? Right? You can't, you know, you can co email a company. Sometimes you may get a response, but for the most part, the people that were in there that also believed in what we were doing made it very easy for us to kind of like understand how to um, position ourselves to, to 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 get the best support from the from the companies. So the the other part, right? Like now you got sponsorships, but accommodations, yeah, right. So like, are you reaching out to the the local like 
hotels and obviously the air, airlines like how do how do you get partnerships to them who do you speak to how, how did that process go yeah with the hotels it was a lot it was a lot easier but not so much in ghana we have the Kempinski, which is the hotel that everybody wants to stay at, you know. Hopefully, we we got that book for you guys right now. Because, Wait, there's no hopefully. Yeah, yeah we yeah. need to, we need that book for you guys right now. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I need to be at the uh, the Kempinski. Uh, the move and pick is the next step. Okay. Right, and then there are boutique hotels, um, like the Qualys, the One Oxford. Those kind of hotels are are nice as well. But you know, really, everybody that somebody wants to stay at these top hotel so really going there you have to have money to put down so if you're getting 40 50 rooms you have to be able to pay it up front and, and be able to cover that that cost up front so we were doing that we would do blocks so we would work with different travel agencies to do blocks to try and block it off like i know essence festival when they do it they block off the entire new orleans so you can't really come in there so the goal is to get to a place where we can block off the whole thing and, and really kind of be able to put more toll gates for us to be able to optimize the money that we're bringing in because we know like every single person that comes into Ghana spends about $2,650 on average. So if you multiply that by the amount of people, let's just say last year we did 30000 that's a lot of money. But I'm not getting all of that money. So how do we kind of create more toll bridges to be able to get more of that is, is where, where we're living in to kind of figure out how to um, make this more of a business. So whether it's verticaling things, like creating more... Um, jobs so uh, we know that last year we knew we needed cleaning so we created a cleaning service so that they can clean our space so that we can pay them at a rate that made sense but we can also keep some of the money back as opposed to outsourcing to an agency or um whether it's uh creating um like owning my own equipment right so this year i'm buying all my stages and everything like that as well so that i don't i can reduce that cost i know that my biggest expense is the talent which is a constant, is always going to go up. And then there's a production cost, which is not is not necessarily, a, uh, it's, it's a constant as well. But if I own most of the equipment, I can reduce that off of my books so that, you know, and I can rent it out and I can make, I can make some money from it as well. So those are some of the things that I'm like, we're thinking about just to kind of be able to kind of make it better. Uh, mm -hmm. But also like, also raising, uh, if you go out in New York, it could be like 10 different clubs popping at one time. And Ghana is not quite like that yet. You know, everybody kind of like migrates to the same place. So we're all at Twist. All right, cool. We leave Twist. We're all going to go to Front Back. Oh, okay. Everybody's going to Front Back. We're going to Ace to the sun rises. You know, pretty much that's literally how it is. So having all of these venues stand on their own is another thing. And you do that by bringing more people in the market. And, you know, so we need the government to do that, obviously, because the more money people have, the more they're probably going to put into the economy. So as far as your data is extremely important um and like you said for sponsors let's drill down on this like when you do when you're solicitating sponsors they want to know like what information so you had mentioned like you know as far as um where the people are coming from you know the money that they're spending not just like okay i got their email and got their phone number like the percentage that are men the percentage that are women the age range how do you find out that information um so i we did surveys on our on our website. So whenever you fill out to board a t buy a ticket, these information you filled out it was required information. It was required or yeah, we optional. required it. We required okay. people to let us know like who was coming into the country. That was under our purview, right? You, you don't, you know, we don't. Obviously, the information is blinded, and you know we can't share it. And you know it's all in our like our lawyer has all the language in there when you when you buy a ticket. But that information is given to us. Um, it also is given to us through the metadata of our socials, so we're able to com compare it. And then our website also is able to kind of like, if you look at the back in the square space, you'll be able to kind of tell where all people are coming up and, and, and what they're doing um, in that space as well. So now, if you look at the analytics on your social platform, you'll be able to kind of see like who's following you and and like the like how much money they make and things of that nature so all of that information is there for you now it's about how you use it to kind of make sense right because if you look at the analytics behind your instagram for instance it will tell you really how to like market to your audience when's the best time to market to your audience so all of those things are some of the things that we've optimized to kind of makes make make it make sense like i knew that women were our biggest customer so last year we know we needed to put a beauty experience in there 
So we got Fenty Beauty to come in. What's the percentage of women versus men? Uh, I think sixty percent. I think that's one of the main reasons why a lot of people love it. Well, there's nothing. There's nothing. Sure, there's not. There's no shortage of women that are coming into <laughs> to Ghana during that time. How do you measure the economic impact? Um. Well, the econ economic impact is there. We have testimonials. There's somebody who said, you know, because so, you know, when we announced that last year would be the last one, there were a lot of people that were kind of like sad because. You can tell that somebody was like, I made a hundred thousand over Airbnbs in just the years that they existed, right? You can tell by more venues are opening, right? There are so many new venues since 2017 up until now, so that's one way for us to be able to tell. Uh, we can tell by the amount of people that are coming into the country. If 16% of people are coming in for tourism, right? Uh, that's and each of them are spending 2,650. If you multiply 16% of let's say a million, which is the amount of people that came in 2017, and you multiply that by two point uh, 2650, which is the average spend that Ghana government report has, has given us. That's a couple, couple, um, like couple, couple million, couple hundred million, right? So it's like, we're bringing in a lot of people into the country and each one is spending X amount on average. And if they're spending X amount, that's how you know that the impact that you're having on the community. And we wanted to know that because we wanted to be able to go and say, hey, our event alone is bringing in this amount of people what can you do? And some of it we tested as well. When we announced that we weren't going, we got a lot of calls from the government to sit down and talk about how this is in, you know, supporting tourism. Uh, another thing is we've seen that a lot more brands are willing to come into the space because of us and through us to come in. Uh, you know, We started off with Twitter, but we've worked with Amazon. I'm uh, sorry, we've worked with, excuse me, not Amazon. We've worked with um, Meta. We've worked with Instagram. We've worked with TuneCore, Sony Music. We've worked with AudioMac. Audio Mac, for instance, you know, credits us as one of the main reasons why they've been able to grow their audience in Ghana and across West Africa as well. We've done a lot of work with them. Um, so our relationship building and the partners that we've built are clear examples of how we can, like, you know, acknowledge how much we've done. For instance, when we started in 2018, Spotify was not even looking at West Africa as an option of a place for them to, to come in. And, and it's interesting because Spotify had one of the best playlists in Afrobeats ever because they had a guy there named Tunde who understood the music and he broke it down into different genres of African music. So the Ama Pianos, the African Fusion, the um, the Azunto music, he, he broke it down that way. And he was driving it so well, but they end up closing out his whole department. Two, three years later, Spotify does an activation in Ghana, which is interesting to me. Mm -hmm. That tells us about the impact as well. Um, that we've that we've been able to do and also our numbers keep growing like we've never had a downpour uh, like uh, you know a downward try uh, of you know of of attendees last year we did 30,000 in 2022 how much this year Th uh this year well we're hoping to go 40,000 40, 20,000 each day you know over over two days uh but last year we did 30,000 over two days the year before that was the pandemic year we work with Ghana's government to write the rules to open up you know um you know Events for everyone on the continent. And we did ten thousand five, and that was because of a government limit. So twenty thousand each day. Is that would that is it twenty thousand? Because it's the same people each day, though, right? Yeah, but you count it by individuals that come in. Yeah. So if you have forty thousand, so I'm just doing the math, right? If you have forty thousand people at that average spend, that's over a hundred million. Yeah. If if the government said in two thousand seventeen they brought in a million people came in, it was sixteen percent of your audience and mm -hmm. they did that that's like 400 million yeah wait explain that math to me so, again. <laughs> so like yeah. you said it was a million people that came into ghana yeah in 2019 so 16 percent of the the people that came in so that's 160,000 people yep if they all spend 2650 that's like that's 400 that's correct but that's for the whole country for the country so they came to ghana because of the festival they didn't mean they all, all came, came. To right, right 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 yeah, exactly. yeah so the, the i mean these numbers was it astronomical? Yeah, astronomical. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's just like it's spread out, right? Right. Because I don't own the hotels. Exactly. I so, don't own the flights. I don't own the. So yes, people are spending this. So we know we're creating this economic. It's activity. how do we now? And how do we part now become a part of the ecosystem? Yeah. Uh, how do we make it? So by creating services and verticaling things yeah. by. Um, 
by also working with the hotels to kind of strike deals where maybe I get rates that I can I can give out like uh, affiliate, type set, situation. affiliate type situations. We're looking into like charter and planes, right? Because Delta's going crazy. So if I can do charter flights where we reduce the cost for people and we can still make some funds off of it, you know, to challenge Delta to come down because people maybe won't take that. Those are options for us as well. Yeah. Um, optimizing, one of the things that I love about you guys' platform is how much you've optimized social. Uh, like your, your, your YouTube and, and things of that nature. We haven't done that yet. You know, our focus, like, if you want to see what we do, you have to be there, and I think that's mm -hmm. part of it. But we know that we can generate more by, like, doing more social, selling content. Uh, last, we actually have a film coming out with Meta that was a 3D film shot of the performances and the experience in Ghana. So those are things that we want to do more of yeah. uh, moving Did, forward. You, one of the things that you, and you, you left a lasting impact is you said the jobs. Yeah, and so you create over five thousand jobs. So I, that helps the economy too. So absolutely, what what type of jobs are you creating, and are those jobs sustainable after we leave December? Like, are these people staying with these jobs throughout the years, the twelve months of the year? No, a portion of them are. Uh, so most of these are production jobs. Um, you know, people who are building, they probably work for three months, um, three months. So seasonal jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to get it where we can build. Um, a system of like a temp agency, if you may, right? So right now when I come and I'm looking for somebody to build the space, it's it's very limited amount of people. So creating a temp agency where now we can actually outsource the services and provide services to people is the next level for us because we've been paying out so much, we need to reel some of that in. So by owning the equipment, now we can, you know, actually train our individuals, get trainers so that now we can also now provide service, but not only in Ghana, but like across um, West Africa and possibly other parts. Yeah, when, well. when you own the equipment, now you can re create more content. Now, I was uh, watching Snowfall. They yeah. had an episode when they went to Ghana. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And I was just like, look how beautiful they've captured this. So now, like, you you can literally create a production studio based on the equipment you have. Exactly. Um, a lot of people are doing that right now. So I know Idris Elba is looking to open up a production studios. Um, Tyler Perry has talked about it, a few others. But yeah, we've, we've, we've been doing it and we're going to continue to do it and we want to do it. I think there's so much stories to tell. So I think there's even more space for more people to come in. I think the best way to do it is to come in and collaborate with people on the ground like Idris is doing, like mm -hmm. some of the others are doing as well. Just kind of working with people on the ground to build out opportunities and, and that's some of the work we're doing so talk about like you know attracting corporate sponsors the process of doing that putting together a deck what should be in a deck and all of that type of corporate reach like do you do it yourself do you have an agency that does it for you no i do it myself i've built most of our, all of our decks for myself every single piece of writing uh, you see on the website or in our decks i wrote it uh with my bare hands right so my thing is like you want the deck to look like something that anybody can look at it and understand your brand. Like if they have any questions, um, it should be about process, not necessarily what is, right? Um, how do we make this happen? Not necessarily what is. And um, it should speak to you. It's like your resume, if you may, of what you've done, the numbers, what the numbers are saying, why does it benefit them? What can they do or when they come there? How do they see themselves in your activation? So uh, we've grown from just a festival over two days. At the festival, there's so many different opportunities. You can have a photo moment. You can have a activation where people can interact. Uh, so we've done activations with, for instance, YouTube, where we built a shorts program. YouTube was um, was launching a short form program, which is like you know the TikTok, the Reels, and, and they were launching in Ghana. So we worked with them to build a 40 by 40 playground where people could go in there and create content. At the time, Ghana was not a priority market for YouTube, but through our activation, YouTube reassessed and realized Ghana is a priority market. That day alone, we were able to create a thousand plus reels, I mean, well, shorts for, for YouTube in Ghana. So that's one type of activation you can have. Um, we also worked with YouTube, uh, Uber last year. There was a young man who used scrap metal to create a car like an actual car that you can drive on a road. So Uber wanted to highlight that and use that as an activation on the ground to be able to give people discounted tickets. So that's that's a display activation. Um, or we can do more immersive activations like we did with Twitter where people could scan their barcodes on their wristband and that could send a tweet or do things like that to kind of engage um, with with the community. Or uh, last year we worked with YouTube again to create National Jill Off Day. 
right? So there are different several, and that was a digital activation. Mm -hmm. So we do a combination of digital activation, in-person activations, panel discussions, um, and we've expanded our portfolio to be able to do all of these things. Um, outside of the festival, we also have the Africa Expo, which is an opportunity for us to kind of have discussions about real life, as in you are interested in agriculture in Ghana? All right, cool. These are experts that don't understand it. Let's let's engage them. You're interested in the food industry? Let's engage them. You're interested in, in, in finances? Let's talk to them. You're interested in the music business? Let's have a panel discussions with that. And we've done that with TuneCore, with YouTube, uh, Crux Global. Uh, we've done collaborations with Topicals, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a new brand that she raised $10 million. Last year, she was in Ghana. We did it with Modern, um, um, I think it's Modern Girls. Um, you know, they created a, you know, uh, she's a young girl who started um, teaching about finances in the pandemic. It's Tiffany J does a great work as well. So we've invited some of these people. Um, a lot of our work is also built on collaboration. So bringing an R&B house party to Ghana and having them do a party with Polo Beach. Is something that was was really good at, at building community as well. So now these are all exciting opportunities for partners, right? So if a partner has partner with R and B House Party, for instance, in America, and I tell them, look, you know, they're gonna come to Ghana, and we're gonna do an activation. You could do an activation at the festival, and have the after party or R and B House Party. It makes sense for them, right? Because it's something that's familiar. They can do it out here. They can do it out there. So creating those multiple touch points are some of the key things for a partner because then they get to stretch their dollar which makes them look good to their company as well but also we always deliver on the activation so Fenty came into to Ghana they did the activation they sold way more than they spent on the activation that's a net positive for them so what's the activation look like uh, so Fenty we built a 20 by 20 space for them which was like a beauty bar that people can go get their makeup done consult with makeup artists and 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 they use that as an opportunity to kind of also do makeup for some of the artists as well so now they're getting touch points backstage where talent is getting done with makeup they can associate their brand with the talent mm -hmm. they're also getting content from the ta uh, from the individuals who are going into their space and taking pictures and posting it by Fenty Beauty at Africella Af and also they're getting to sell products so they've made money all the way around for them to kind of for it to make sense for uh Fenty Beauty. So I I know a brand like that is gonna come back, right? All the brands that we've worked with have always come back. Uh Meta came back, Twitter has come back up until Elon took over. <laughs> um you know, um Instagram has come back. You know, we, we anticipate Fenty will come back and we anticipate more beauty brands and our goal is to be able to just kind of keep opening it up. Uh, for it to just be not just the festival as the focal point, but there's so many pieces around it that make it a real mecca for the diaspora when they come back to Ghana. So if you want to party, you have that opportunity. If you want to educate yourself, you have the opportunity. If you want to relax, you have the opportunity. One of the things that I'm really excited about is um, there was um, a young man, his name was Russian, he started a company called Poetry Me. And he reached out to me last year through one of my boys, Neville, and, and you know, I was like, all right, let's do it. a poetry event. Would be really cool. It's something different. Accra is, you know, everybody clubs. Let's let's do something that people would just. And it was amazing. JIV performed, like you know. So for 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 that to be the experience and for it to sell out in that way on his first event in Ghana, I thought that was beautiful. We also did an event with Black Health Connect. So what they did was they set up um, a mixer for Black health professionals across the diaspora, and I thought that was beautiful as well. So we're looking to do more things like that. Meetups conversations, um, panel discussions, uh, idea exchanges. Uh, the hope is for there to be maybe a couple investment groups to come out of this so that they can go and help us build, you know, whether we're building schools, whether we're building communities. I think those are all great opportunities uh, for, for people back here as well. Are, are you seeing that uh, as a, uh, a byproduct of the event? Like we have corporate coming in for the event, but do you see the diaspora investing back in Accra? Yes. As a result? Yes, I've seen people who have gotten their citizenship, their residency, who are actually working from there, who have started businesses, um, you know, whether it's sh importing shea butter or selling baskets or, um, you know, buying property and being be in it. Um, mm -hmm. People are doing a whole bunch of things, you know, whether it's starting clubs, opening up a restaurant. I've seen a lot of that happen in the past couple of years. And frankly, it makes me very happy. Uh, one of the first things people do is probably set up a tour group. Because, you know, if I come, when you're now, I could bring 20 people. And, and, you know, it's a business. And I think it's a really good one. 
Um, but there are so many other things that people can do. I haven't seen anybody venture into agriculture, which I think is like one of the biggest things that that needs to be done. And I, and it's and it's evident because almost all the candidates that are running for president now are talking about agriculture. You know, we have one of the biggest pineapple farms in Ghana, and I know you know we know the owner. And they ship to all of Europe. Like you know, I didn't know that Europeans were eating Ghanaian bananas. I didn't know that, but they are. You know, um, Ghana makes the second, exports the second amount of cocoa, you know, and, and recently, um, you know, the president was like, you know, we're going to try and refine our own cocoa right here in Ghana. So, you know, there's so many different things that are just underutilized. Like, for instance, um, my partner imports chicken and fish. Like, you know, I was like, you know, why, why don't we have a chicken farm right here to be able to produce chicken? to feed people um, in Ghana. So I think those are things that are just, there's so many different opportunities that exist, not only in Ghana, but across um, the continent, that I think that as we continue to get to know each other, the more the diaspora and the continent, that, you know, that collaboration is going to be key in, 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 in growing Africa. Because Africa, is my, Africa is the youngest continent and will be for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. So all of the opportunities go in there, right? All of the governments are fighting over space, you know, whether it's the Chinese, the Russians, the Americans now are getting into the mix. You know, um, you know, black people need to get into the mix. So how do you market? How do you market the event? Um, a lot of our marketing goes to a lot of group uh, group sales. Group sales is one of our biggest ones. Uh, we do a lot. It does, uh, it does a lot of wonders for us. We run a lot of ads on socials across YouTube, across Facebook, uh, across our Instagram. Um, we do a lot of uh, placements. And diff on different websites as well, uh, billboards around the continent. We activate in different cities. Like we have an activation coming up in LA with PVO. Uh, PVO is a partner of ours. We've been partnering for a couple of years. There are young men that started an organization called Positive Vibes Only to celebrate, you know, mental health awareness. Um, and they do that through their programming. So we partner with them. We're doing. We're going to be at Africon with PVO. So we hopefully we'll have you out there as well. Um, you know, we're doing collaborations with Africon. That's another way. Um, a lot of our activations in the U.S. is one of those. Uh, we're doing Cote d'Ivoire April 30th. We have France um, June 18th. We're going to be in London um, in June as well. Um, we have South Africa in September. Kenya in November. So by activating all these spaces, it optimizes the amount of people that are able to come. Oh, we also have Germany at the end of um, August. So that allows us to be able to kind of connect with communities. Last year was the first year I went to Germany for Hype Fest, and that brought in so many Germans into Ghana. And, I, and, and we want to continue doing that by activating and celebrating in these spaces. We're building our audience. I'm sure you guys are seeing the same thing by activating in different cities. Mm -hmm. You're seeing more people come into your space. And literally, it's working for us. It's been working for us, and, and we're looking to do that. And we're also looking for other traditional ways to do it, whether it's like placements on podcasts, uh, whether it's um, through media drops and appearances. Uh, apparently, Hulu is allowing you to do advertisements on Hulu now for a fee. So we're looking into those kind of opportunities as well to kind of grow the audience, but also keep it organic. I think one of the beauties about our festival is you don't feel lost. Although it's big and it's a stadium and it's, it takes a lot of walking to get around, it still feels like a small community of people. Um, and, and I think that that's what people love. And I don't ever want to lose that by just kind of making it um, so big that people can't even see each other. Um, mm -hmm. The beauty is like you can turn left and you see Charlemagne or you can turn right and you can see Bozum and St. John. Like that's the beauty of being in that space and, and everybody is comfortable and nobody feels attacked or or bother. Char Charlemagne was at the Nigerian, uh, the the strip club in Accra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shout out to him. Club but, in Accra is yeah. the first one. Yeah, it's, 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 Silver <laughs> Fox is actually pretty big. It's, 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 it's dope. Do, do you see the, the festival expanding not only in Accra, but in other countries on the continent where it's like people want to have a similar type situation for, for, their, for their country? You said South Africa, you have activations. Nigeria, uh, Morocco, like you see it. Yeah, we've gotten a lot of invitations from different tourism authorities like Uganda, South Africa, mm -hmm. um, Rwanda, uh, to come in Senegal, to come in and like recreate what we've been able to create in Ghana. But we never, like, what I don't want to do is like say I'm going to have a festival in South Africa the way I have it in Ghana. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I, my whole goal is to be able to partner with somebody down there and they can own it and we can own a piece of it. Because I think that in in going into Africa, we have to have a different mindset than we've had here. Like, right, we have to have more of a community mindset. I think that's the beauty about 
living in Africa is about the community. We all eat. There's more of us by working together. So for us, it's about community building. So if we go to South Africa, we're looking to work with a partner in South Africa. We are working with a partner in South Africa. The same thing in Kenya. So I don't need to own it because I can't tell a Kenyan story the way I can tell a Ghanaian right, story. Right. But they can. So how do I give them the resources that I've learned in Ghana to be able to kind of help them recreate this and then they can own it? And then we are part of it. Um, that's the model that we've always thought of for ourselves, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we want to do. And that's why we're creating new services to be able to do that. Yeah, to talk about the philanthropic uh, arm of, of Afro Future, I know yeah. you know you guys have given back money um, to health and, and water initiatives uh, throughout the country. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I'm a brother of Five Eight Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, and um, part of my uh, mantra is always to give back, right? Cultural service, service for humanity. And I've always thought that if somebody's going to give back, it's not enough to just try and guilt trip them into giving back money. You have to give them incentivize. I've always done that through whether it was parties, like, you know, you, you throw a party, you buy a ticket, I'll use, I'll give on your behalf. Like, you've always given back. I'm, I'm my partner and I are both brothers, so we're like, you know what, this is what we're going to do. We're going to invite people to participate in some of the give backs that we're doing, but we are also going to use ticket sales and give out 5% of the ticket sales to whatever charity cause that we're looking to um, to support. The year one, we work with WaterAid, which is a company that is all over the world, actually, but basically they reduce uh, limit, um, uh, lack of access to water and build toilets for people. You know, so there's still people who are using non-traditional toilets that you can flush, you know, either they, they lack water or they're, they're, they're toilet in a, in a hole. So we, we're building that out. We, we built that out. So we donated to them. Um, but then we adopted a school. Um, we work with Twitter to remodel the school. We built a new ceiling, new floors. Um, fed them for a year. We did that for a couple of years. Uh, and then recently we've been actually just taking that action on the road. So whether it's um, doing a thousand meals and giving it out in the community or giving out school supplies. Um, last year we partnered with Madachi Foundation, which is um, one of one of my good bros actually created a, a foundation that provides sneakers to students. Uh, he found people in his community in Ghana their barrier to going to school was they didn't have shoes, so they had to walk miles to go to school. So he wanted to be able to bring sneakers back to Ghana so that he can provide them with shoes to wear on their way to school. And some of that that's some of the work. We work with him to kind of create a, like, in Ghana, when the year was over, it wasn't like just a cut day. It was like, we call it our day. And it was a special day because, um, it's funny, because the things that we care about is, is weird. Um, it was an hour a day, but you were all bringing like your best meals. And that's how you competed. Out here, you know, you wear your sneakers, you be your best fit, because you had a dress down there or something like that. Yeah. In Ghana, the last day was our day. It was like, you basically have a feast. Like everybody brings their food and shows off. I got the best snacks, something like that. So we recreated that experience for kids and gave them sneakers, face painting, engaging them, playing with them, you know, giving them, you know, reading to them and, and things of that nature. And this gives our audience and attendees an opportunity to really engage with the local with the local community and see what's um, what's important to them. So we want to give people a 360 experience. When you come to Ghana, you're going to see a high life, right? But depend, if you're coming with American dollar or British pound or euros, you're going to stay in the nice places. You're going to eat at the nice places. You're going to go to the nice parties. But we don't want you to lose out on understanding what the entire um experiences like how the people on the ground are living what is what is it like to barter what is it like to try the food what is you know how does poverty look you mm -hmm. know what i'm saying what are opportunities you know if there's schools things that nature exchange program those are things that we're looking at uh trying to figure out how to how to create but it gives other people opportunity to see to ideate for themselves that how they can give back or support so those are some of the things we do so um talk about changing the name yeah um so you know for a long time Obviously, everybody knows we were sued by Coachella, um, and that was one of the major driver reasons why we accelerate the change to the name. But also, we were also grown beyond just being Afrochella. Uh, what we anticipate with Afro Future is recreating a new world for the diaspora in reality, where we connect and 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 have a space to to to, to congregate and be able to build together. Um, the expo, the museum. And some of the experiences we're creating around the um, the experiences, what we consider the future, 
Uh, if you look at all of these business conferences that are happening, some at Harvard, Georgetown, MIT, Stanford, all over the place, but they're talking about Africa, but outside of Africa. The U.S. just did a conference, happened in D.C., outside of Africa. Our opportunity is to be able to bring, bring that energy back to the continent. We never want to activate the festival itself outside of the continent. Our whole goal is to get more people to come back to the continent. So we consider what we're doing and what we're going to be doing for the next couple of years, the future, and, and Afro future just made. Right? So, so what happened with the lawsuit? Did you settle? Yeah, we settled. We settled out. Um, um, they have points. We have points. Uh, we had a mark in Ghana. They had a mark here. And we were just trying to figure out what was what was the best option for us uh you know and after a while because you know it just was more expensive than it needed to be uh and it was just easier for us to just kind of like come to an agreement to kind of like leave each other alone um and and that required us to also change our name as well and, and we were we were amenable to it as well happy afro future it is yeah. so how long after the event is finished before you start preparing for the next one uh, immediately. Uh, as soon as the event is finished, we do a postmortem with the whole team just to kind of figure out, you know, what are the opportunities for growth? Um, what went well? What do we like? What we want to keep? I think as far as structure of the event, we just got to the perfect structure that we like as far as how people are going to navigate through the space. So that takes a lot off of our plate. But each year comes with a new challenge that we have to face. Uh, you know, 2017 was we just didn't have money. 2018 was just kind of navigating a new space. 2019 was scaling way beyond where the team was at. Um, 2020 was the pandemic. 2021 was our first major artist, like WizKid, right? And last year was two two days. So now we've gotten to our, I guess, final form of what the festival is going to look like. And now it's just about making sure it kind of grows uh, organically as as it stands. Did you announce the lineup yet for this year? No, no. We're looking to do that uh, at the end of April, Africa Day. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Africa Day is when we when we're looking to to announce it. Uh, we actually never used to announce the lineup until like the last month because we didn't want people to just buy tickets just for the artists. We wanted people to buy tickets for the experience. But recently, we've been like announcing all of it together to kind of you know give people ample time to be able to prepare to buy the tickets because the ticket prices are too high, too high for no reason. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, been a pleasure. Definitely got to connect when we come out there for sure. Yeah, for sure. We're gonna make sure you have a good time. We're gonna take out a silver fox. <laughs> We're gonna take out a silver fox. We're gonna take out a twist, and make sure y'all good out there. I mean, the one thing that I can, you know, I used to never promise it, but I could promise you a good time in Ghana if you are open to really just kind of experiencing new things, trying new things, meeting people, and just kind of talking to people you have an amazing experience. Like, you know, nobody is really there to bother you, to haggle you, to, to hassle you. Yeah, people are going to ask you for some money. You know, you look like you have money, people are definitely going to ask you for some money. But I think you can experience that anywhere around the world. But I think the beauty about the people in Ghana and what drives me is that everybody seems happy, right? They don't have to have much to be happy. And that kind of drew me to the continent. It kind of made me understand. Like, I was making good money here. I had a good job. You know, I had an apartment. I had everything I wanted. But, you know, sometimes you could just come home, get off the train and be frustrated. But there, they didn't have much. And I would go there and they were just so happy in some cases. And mm -hmm. I thought that that there's a beauty in that. There's a beauty in this kind of like people being happy. And I think it has a lot to do with the experience of just kind of seeing everyone around you and enjoying them and everything that you're going through. The beauty and the struggle, I guess, uh, for some people. But also... On the flip side, there are people that are doing pretty well. Like, they don't ever have to come to America. Like, <laughs> they can get on a plane, come here, buy clothes, and go right back the next day. Like, you know, you know, and, and to this, you know, the disparity, there's beauty in it, but there's also struggle in it. And I think that as more black people come into the space, it's going to change. It's changed so much over the past seven years. So I look forward to seeing how much is going to change in the next 10. Uh, because I, it's definitely changing for the positive. People are questioning things. People are pushing government to do things. People are creating content. People are connecting. So it's beautiful. So I'm looking forward to hosting you in Ghana. Yeah, I'm, you I know the Goodwill Ambassador of Tourism. So <laughs> I'm looking forward yeah, to being there. You're good. <laughs> Trust me. You, you're going to be fine in Ghana. You ain't got to worry about nothing. Anything you need, like, it's, you know, pretty much a phone call away or a discussion, like, you know, from visas to whatever you need, cars, yeah. anything you need. I'm excited. I'm yeah. excited. For sure. Thank you. All right, guys, there you have it. Oh, 
All right, we just got to say this, right? Yeah. Best jollof rice. Is it Nigeria or is it Ghana? Come on, man. That's Ghana all day. Easily. Yeah, come to our crowd restaurant right here in New York. We got, <laughs> we got, we got the best jollof rice. We won it twice. Twice. I actually got to invite you. We have What's a- What's the name of the spot in Harlem? Uh, a restaurant. Both of them are called Accra restaurant. Where's that? Um, we are on Burnside Avenue in Davidson. Yeah. And then we have um, on 2065 Adam Clayton Power Boulevard. Uh, both both of the restaurants. What street is that? That's on 7th. 7th. 7th Ave. What's, Ave. The, what's the street? Adam Clayton Power. 123rd, between 123rd, 123rd and 124th. Yo, that's crazy. Okay. Yo, I yeah. ate there for Thanksgiving. What? I promise you. No, yeah, that's fine. Two years ago. Oh, that's I dope. was like, we're not cooking this year. Yeah. And that's where we went. Oh, that's amazing. I'm glad. I hope you liked it too. <laughs> you know, we actually, we do this this thing called Battle of Jollof uh, right here in New York City. So it's like a basketball game yeah. and a competition with Jollof Rice. And, you know, a cry, a cry restaurant won both of them. So I definitely hope y'all pull up. And I definitely want to invite y'all to the event too. It's going to be good. Yeah. Nah, definitely. Definitely got to come to the restaurant. And to, so, That's great. All right, what's the website, the social media, and all yeah, that? Absolutely. So you can find us online at Afro Future, um, on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, LinkedIn, any of those. We're there. Uh, AfroFuture dot com is also our website. So looking forward to hosting y'all there as well. Yeah, appreciate it, man. That's dope. There you have it. See, I'm, I'm already been Patreon with yeah, you. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I love that. I'm glad that you was enjoying. <laughs> yeah, love is love, y'all. Thank you. Peace. My graduates from my school being Forbes. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs> a mic drop. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs>